Do you know what immortality means? How about senogenics? I'm not getting, I'm getting blank looks this morning. <laughs> immortality is the term coined by author Catherine Mayer to describe the growing trend in America of ageless living, living agelessly. And senogenics is the science behind living agelessly through a combination of nutrition, exercise, and hormone optimization. Here's the point behind it all, behind all this theory, friends. You don't have to grow old. Did you know that? Yes, you did. Somebody said that. You don't have to grow old. Using supplements, diet, proper exercise, and, of course, living in the right environment that is designed for you, you can restore your body to its natural state of youthfulness. Like a popular bumper sticker says, I refuse to get old. Now, a couple of stats to ponder from a Time Magazine article just from last month. I think it was April 25th or something like that. Across the developed world, we are now living 30 years longer than at the beginning of the 20th century. By 2050, a fifth of all humanity will be older than 60 years of age, and 27% of the population of the United States will be older than 60. Here's another startling estimate. By 2050, there will be 6 million men and women over the age of 100. An increasing number of affluent Americans are betting they can turn their body clocks back and live agelessly. They are spending thousands of dollars a month on supplements and therapy to do it. There are now more than 50 sun cities. These are cities created for people to live agelessly. There are more than 50 sun cities in the United States where people can live in optimal settings for ageless living. Amortals, as they are called, refuse to structure their lives around getting older, and they prefer to ignore their age. They deny the inevitability of death through senogenics, the science of living ages, agelessly. What do you think? <laughs> Yes, Solomon would say you're nuts. <laughs> Solomon would say, that's crazy. And in Ecclesiastes 12, we're concluding our study of Ecclesiastes, and I'm glad to see you're all here this morning to talk about getting older. We didn't get a huge boycott today. <laughs> Okay, that's what I figured. You're all here because you forgot what we were talking about, right? <laughs> right? The point of Ecclesiastes is to warn us that aging is normal, death is inevitable, so we ought to take that message to heart and live for the Lord while we have time on this earth. You will, no, you are growing older, and you will die, so face it honestly, and don't waste your life. That's the argument as we come to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Principle number one then, live responsibly before you grow old. We come to this, the end of our study of the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, let's set the stage. Solomon is writing as an old man here. And he is looking back over all that he has learned through the years of his life. 
The book of Ecclesiastes is actually written to young people. And that's why as he comes to the end of the book, he says, remember your creator in the days of your youth when you are young. Solomon warns young people to remember to put God first in your lives before you get old and face the inevitability of death and you no longer have the energy to do all of those things for the Lord. So watch out, young people. We live like we have all the time in the world. I can remember when I was 20. Yes, I can remember that far back. I can remember when I was 20, but when I was 20, I thought 40 was ancient. Now I think it's young. See how the perspective changes? Retirement is nearing, actually starting in now for the baby boomer generation, my generation. About 77 million baby boomers will be entering retirement. And the anti-aging industry is trying to keep us young. Doctors are prescribing large doses of supplements that they believe prevent the decay of the body's organs. The American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. You didn't even know there was a place like that, did you? Well, there is. The American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine reports the industry had an annual income of $56 billion in 2006. And expected, when this article was written, to have $79 billion of income in 2009. Aging well has become a big business. Human growth hormones, natural estrogen, progesterone, supposed to do all sorts of things for you, relieve your symptoms. Testosterone is believed to aid memory and bone mass. One person who has become convinced of all the effectiveness of these supplements is retired dentist Dr. Howard Benedict, who was 61 years of age in 2006. I don't know where he is today, but in 2006, he was spending $10,000 a year on supplements to keep him young. He claimed then that he felt like he was 20 years of age. 60, you feel like you're 20, $10,000 a year to get there. The truth is, really, that we worship in our culture, we worship at the altar of youth. We really do. And it is idolatry, is what it is. It is idolatry. We are working so hard to stay young that we've forgotten God's call to our lives. God tells us to face growing old with dignity and to honor the Lord with our lives while we have time on this earth. Only one life will soon be passed, right? There's an old statement, an old ditty that went, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. So, Solomon is going to end his whole study, his old philosophy of life, by exhorting us while we are young to live for the Lord. And he gives us here in chapter 12 an extended description of growing old. Not because he's being morbid, but because he wants us to face this reality honestly. And I think our culture needs to hear this. I think we need to hear this. It's not a pleasant description. Hmm. Growing old is not all it's cracked up to be. Especially by all the amortals of our society. Look at how Solomon described growing old in verses 2 through 8. So he said that you want to remember your creator before these days come when you say I have no delight in them. And verse 2, before the sun, before the sun, the light, the moon, and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop 
The grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through windows grow dim, and the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low, and one will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Furthermore, men are afraid of high places and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms and grasshopper and the grasshopper drags himself along, and the caperberry is ineffective. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed. The pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Now, notice the description here. It's a, an imaginative, poetic description, really. And let me try to unpack the poetry this morning. We, we can't really be dogmatic here, but following the Jewish rabbis, the Jewish rabbis actually wrote a fair bit on this passage in Ecclesiastes. And following their lead, let me unpack this poetry, all right? Because it's all figurative language. Solomon begins with the sun, the light, the moon, and the stars being darkened. Old age is characterized by diminishing joy, increasing discouragement, despair, darkness. The clouds quickly return after the rain, indicating that it seems like the troubles and anxieties of life are back almost as soon as they left. You know, the rainstorm goes, clouds are right back there again. That seems to be life as you get older. It's harder and harder to handle the clouds that fill our lives. The keepers of the house tremble. Those are the legs and the arms that begin to tremble in old age, causing one strong man to stoop with age. Isn't this pleasant? The grinders ceasing because they are few, that's the loss of your teeth. So you can't eat what you used to eat. Those who look through the windows grow dim means that our eyesight fails as time goes on. When the doors to the street are shut, it's because our ears no longer hear the sounds of life all around us. Older people rising at the sound of the bird points to the inability to sleep that comes in our later years. You quickly awake. The daughters of song now sing softly this is used actually elsewhere in the Old Testament. Dad read me a passage this morning that uses this one, where as an old man he no longer could hear the daughters of song sing their sweet entertainment. Why? Because you fall asleep in the evening. Well, today we probably would say something like, I doze off during the evening news on the television <laughs> or the show that I'm watching. I do that already. <laughs> Fears seem much more heightened with age so that we fear high places. And the traffic on the streets seems very fearful and it, there are a lot of terrors out there and you're worried and anxious about all of this stuff. The almond tree was a well-known symbol of old age because when it flowered, the flowers were all white and the whole almond tree would be white, signifying the white hair of our later years. And there's more. <laughs> the grasshopper. <laughs> Isn't this great, Mac? <laughs> the grasshopper, normally full of quick energy, slowly drags himself along, just like we slow down as we get old. The caperberry is ineffective. Now, the caperberry was a low, trailing shrub from the Middle East. And the flower bud and the berries were used as spices in the food to give it flavor and taste. And the bud was... The, the flowers, excuse me, the berries were also used as an aphrodisiac to um, make your sexual life be better. Well, it came to be a symbol of our desires and appetites. And in our later years, we lose those appetites. Food doesn't taste so good anymore. The aphrodisiac no longer works. When all these things happen, he says, we soon go to our eternal homes. And the mourners quickly return to the streets and back to their working lives, having said goodbye to us. The golden bowls were the fancy lamps of the ancient world, and, and in the wealthy homes they were often held up by a silver cord. 
When the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is shattered, the light of our lives is snuffed out. We have an old hymn based on this passage, do we not? Someday the silver cord will break, and I no more as now shall sing. The light of life is gone, snuffed out. Remember your creator before the water jar is smashed at the well and the pulley is broken so no water of life can be drawn any longer. When all this takes place, our bodies will return to the dust of the ground and our spirits will return to their maker, our creator. Now, aren't you glad you came this morning? That's where we're headed. As we grow older. Solomon says, meaningless, meaningless, all is meaningless. If this is all there is, what's the point? If this is where we're all headed, what's the point? Time is running out for all of us. We're all headed to this end. James in the New Testament reminds us, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, if this is our destiny, how should we live today? What's that supposed to do for us today? How should we use today if we don't even know about tomorrow? Do you have tomorrow? Do you know you have tomorrow? Nobody does. We make all these plans for tomorrow and we forget about today. All we have is now. In 2010, Accenture, a management consulting company, surveyed 1,000 full-time U.S. female workers ages 22 to 35, so young, about issues related to their work. When asked what sacrifices they would make concerning their personal and professional lives, over half the women, 54% of the women, said they were ready and willing to give up personal time to make more money. I'd sacrifice time to make more money. Now think about that. Time, time is much more valuable than money when you really think about it. Time is the one element we all have in limited supply. There is only so much time in every day. And each minute that passes is a minute closer to death, Solomon would tell us. We don't think like that, do we? Do you think like that today? Mostly we ignore that reality. In 1961, microbiologist Leonard Hayflick made a rather discouraging discovery, which is now known as the Hayflick condition. He discovered that most human cells can only divide a limited number of times before they stop dividing. Since the division of cells is the way we stay alive, when your cells start slowing down their division and stop dividing, what's happening? You're dying. And he said, from the minute you are born, your cells have a limited time to divide. And as our cells stop dividing, we age. And there is not one thing you can do about it. Even if you never get sick, your cells will stop dividing. And you will age and die. Our time is limited, so we must start by, Solomon says, how did he start verse 1? Remember your creator in the days of your youth. While we are young, when we can still decide to invest our time in ways that honor God, that's Solomon's warning to every one of us. He warns us to seek godly aging. Godly aging is not ageless living. Godly aging is not ignoring, pretending, avoiding, or fighting our age. Godly aging is trusting God 
to help us live out our years with grace and dignity, knowing that we have lived for the Lord and we can face death without regrets. The sad truth is, the sad truth is that we're not living our lives for our Lord. The sad truth is that the average time that Americans spend in spiritual activities per day is nine minutes. Nine minutes with God a day. You know, if we fail to spend our time time for the Lord now, what happens? We come to the end of our lives full of regrets. Because there's nothing more. This is it. So live responsibly, Solomon says, before you grow old. And secondly, live biblically according to God's wisdom. Live biblically according to God's wisdom. Tonight's show host, Jay Leno, does these man-on-the-street interviews. You've probably seen, seen those if you've watched his show. One night he collared some young people on the street to ask them questions about the Bible. Young people. So he said, can you name one of the Ten Commandments? He asked two college-age women. One replied, freedom of speech. <laughs> Jay Leno said to the other, complete this sentence for me. Let he who is without sin, her response was, have a good time. (laughs) Jay Leno then turned to a young man and asked, who according to the Bible was eaten by a whale? The uh, confident answer was, Pinocchio. (laughs) People today simply don't know the Bible. Really. Really. And if they don't know the Bible, they don't have God's wisdom. And if they don't have God's wisdom, they don't know how to live well as God has designed us. He's our maker. Solomon wrote down all this wisdom to help us live well. Verse 9, in addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Now, as a teacher for many years... Guess what verse is the theme verse of college students? Hey, professor, the study of books is wearying. It's tiresome. The writing of books is endless. Why are we doing all this? Right? I have heard that many times over the years. Well, Solomon is not really saying that at all. Not exactly that anyway. He is saying, if you notice the precursor, he is saying, beyond the Bible, the writing of books and the studying of things becomes wearisome. Beyond the Bible, beyond God's wisdom. Wise men writing the words of the Bible are like cattle prods that prick us painfully at times, he says. But the purpose is what? To help us live better lives. We don't like that message. We don't like that verse that pricks us and says there's something wrong with the choices we're making in life. Who likes to be told that? But the truth of God's word pricks us and goads us and tries to make us face up to what we're choosing to do so that we will live in accord with God's word. That's the point of God's word. The words of wise men and women that are in the Bible here, he says, are like well-driven nails that solidly anchor what we believe. 
They are all given by one shepherd, the shepherd of our souls. Who's that? That's God. He's the creator and the shepherd of our our souls. He gives us these things, not because he wants to make us miserable, but because he's pricking and prodding us to understand that ourselves, that the choices we're making are not the choices that will help us live well as he designed us to live. God knows what we need, and what we need is what he tells us in the Bible. Beyond that, be warned that all the study of the world will ultimately lead to weariness, becomes tiresome. You know, we have so much information today. We live in the information age, right? We have so much information today at our fingertips. You can watch the the, the television shows while you surf the internet on your iPad. And there's information coming out constantly at us. You do a Google search and you get a million hits. We have so much information. And there are so many books written. And there are so many articles written. Our problem is not the lack of information. Our problem is not the lack of books. It's not the lack of articles. It's not the lack of things to look up. Our problem is information overload. We don't know how to process all that stuff. We have no grid through which to process it. So we just bounce around from one new thought to the next, not one new concept to the next. This is very applicable, is not, to the 21st century? Isn't that the life we lead? And it's leading, he says, ultimately to wearisomeness. It's just, it's going to wear you out. You, you just can't keep up with all that stuff. The thing we need to do is we need to be able to process that information and make good choices in life. That's wisdom. Biblical wisdom. And the grid through which we process it is the Bible. It's God's wisdom that helps us process and make good choices. The problem is we want to go our own way. We want to do our own thing in life. We've made choices and we like those choices. We don't want to give them up. And so we want to go our own way. And let me tell you something you can always find someone, some book, some study, someone somewhere who will back you with whatever choice you want to make. Whatever moral choice, whatever lifestyle choice, whatever decision, whatever whatever you want to do, you can find somebody to back you up, right? Probably a bunch of people. Just do a Google search. question is, does it square with what God's wisdom says? We would be much better off if we went to the Bible and we said, look, I want to find out what you, God, want for my life, how you want me to live, what you want me to do. I want to honor you, Lord, first even if it's painful, even if it means I have to make some choices now that I don't want to make, because I know, God, I know that you know what's best for me because you are my creator, and I will answer to you. Philosopher Emile Callier was born in a small French village near the end of the 19th century. His early education was committed totally to naturalism and against all supernaturalism, leaving absolutely no room in his philosophy of life. Remember, Ecclesiastes is about a philosophy of life. His philosophy of life left no room for God anywhere. But he ended up in the trenches of World War I. And as he talked to his close childhood friend sitting there in the trench, a bullet whizzed by him and killed his friend in front of his eyes. And he had no answer for this reality. This is real now. After he was discharged from the war, he went back to his studies in philosophy. And he wrote, 
During long night watches in the foxholes, I had in a strange way been longing, I must say it, however strange it may sound, for a book that would understand me. But I knew of no such book. Now I would in secret prepare one for my own private use. And so I went on reading for my courses. And what he did was, he goes on to explain in his journal, what he did as he was reading all of his philosophy books and all of these studies is he would take quotes from those and he would put them into a little leather bound book that he kept because his concept was he was going to write his own book that would understand him. And then when he came to the end of it all, he could read through the book that would understand him. So he'd collected all of these sayings, all of these quotes about life. And at last the the day came when he put the finishing touches on, on his little book. He said, the book that would understand me. And he described a beautiful sunny day in which he went out, traveled outside the city, sat under a big tree, and he sat down to read the book that would understand him. And as he read, he became very discouraged. And he said, I realized that this was worthless because I had written it and I didn't understand me. And he put the leather book away and he disappointedly walked back home. Well, on that same day, his wife had come into the possession of a Bible. Now, he had always been adamant that no Bibles were allowed in the home. He had never even seen a Bible in his life. And at the age of 23, he'd never examined the Bible. At the end of that day, she apologetically tried to explain how she had accidentally picked up a copy of the Bible, but he grabbed it and rushed To my study, he writes with it, I opened it and chanced upon the Beatitudes. I read and read and read, now aloud with an indescribable warmth surging within. I could not find words to express my awe and wonder, and suddenly the realization dawned upon me. This was the book that would understand me. I needed it so much, yet unaware I had attempted to write my own in vain. I continued to read deeply into the night, mostly from the Gospels, and lo and behold, as I looked through them, the one of whom they spoke, the one who spoke and acted in them, became alive in me, the living Lord. And he became a Christian. Because he read the book that would understand him. You can't write a book that will understand you because you don't understand you. But the Bible is written by our maker to help us understand ourselves. The Bible is God's text message to us. Now, I know lots of you have the Bible on your iPods and your iPads and and all other sorts of places. The question is not whether we have the Bible. You've got it with you probably this morning. The question is not whether you have the Bible, but and it's not even whether you're reading the Bible, but are you... Hearing God in the Bible. Is it becoming real to you? Is it changing how you make choices in life? That's the real issue, isn't it? We've got it. In fact, it's the number one best-selling book down, I mean, still is in America. But the question is, is it changing us? Are we hearing God? as we read it. So often I hear the argument, well, you know, I can't have any fun in life if I do what God says in the Bible. Really? Let me say to you what Jesus said, that in him you have abundant life, the real fun of life by following him. God doesn't give us all this information in the Bible just to hear himself talk or because he likes to make us miserable. God wants us to be happy in him. Now, when I use that term happy, I mean his kind of happiness, the kind that lasts for eternity. 
And he tells us in the Bible how we can find true happiness in him. And Ecclesiastes is all written to teach us how we can find true happiness in a real philosophy of life that deals with the realities of life and points us to how we ought to live. God knows that when we disobey what he tells us, that we will eventually reap the consequences for our choices. That's simply real life. And when we obey what God tells us in the Bible, then God guides us to a better life. A.W. Tozer wrote, A man by his sin may waste himself, which is to waste that which on earth is most like God. This is man's greatest tragedy, God's heaviest grief. Whenever I choose to sin, and when I use the word sin, what am I saying? Anything that disobeys what's written here, right? Disobeys God. When I choose to sin, I am wasting my life. And I am wasting that which is most like God. Therefore, that is my greatest tragedy. That's a very convicting concept to me. The bottom line is that I only have today to live. I actually don't even know that I have today, do I? I only have right now to live. We only have so much time on this earth. We are dying every day. And we waste today by living for ourselves. The whole point of Ecclesiastes is summed up in these final two verses. We arrive here at the end of our whole study of Ecclesiastes. And it is this. Live for the Lord while you've got time. That's Ecclesiastes. Look at verses 13 and 14. The the conclusion. When I get to the end of all of this, Solomon writes, When all has been heard, the conclusion is, fear God, that's honor God, and keep his commandments, obey him. Because this applies to every person, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. There you have it. That's what it boils down to. You've only got this life. Live it for the Lord while you still have time because he will evaluate everything in our lives. One night, Canon Hay Aitken preached to a large audience in Bristol, England on the text, you must be born again. There in the congregation was a brilliant young man named Horatio Bottomley, and he listened intently to the sermon there in Bristol. He heard the preacher at the end of the sermon call all who were there to trust in the grace of Christ, to commit their lives to Jesus Christ. And he he knew in his heart that this was talking to him. And he was moved. But he said to himself, not now, not now. I'll run my own life. Later, maybe. (laughs) And he did. He made a fortune, actually. He made a name for himself as a lawyer, prosecuting criminals. But when Horatio Bottomley was 63 years of age, he himself was convicted of a crime and sentenced to seven years in prison at 63. And while he was there in prison, another man visited him and asked to pray with him. Bottomley said that would be fine, and in the course of the conversation, the other man said, I'd like to tell you my story. Many years ago, I was in Bristol, and I heard a preacher, Canon Hay Aitken, preach on the text, you must be born again. I was so deeply moved that I committed my life to Jesus Christ and to following him. And ever since then, Christ has been my all in all. And I have lived a full life. Bottomley was silent for quite some time. And then he said to the man, you know what? I too heard that very same message that day long ago. I too was deeply moved 
I knew my need of Christ, but I rejected him. Not now, later. And then he said these words, a life without God is a wasted life. A life without God is a wasted life. I wish, I truly wish, that I could wrap that concept up in a little gift package and give it to each of you, (laughs) myself too. A life without God is a wasted life. You say, well, Dave, uh, you know, I've got time. I'm young. (laughs) What did Solomon say? Remember your creator in the days of your youth. I'll think about committing myself to Christ someday. Let me say, really, from the depths of my heart, you may never have another chance. Really. Because you do not know what will happen. Today, this moment is all you really know that you have. Please, if you have not done so, turn your life over to Jesus Christ today. Commit yourself to him. Trust him. Ask his forgiveness. You've sinned. Everyone has. There are no outcasts. God's love is available to you. All you have to do is turn to him and say, yes, I believe. Forgive me my sins. I commit myself to you. You know, Jesus called us to live an abundant life. People might say, you know, I want to live a little first. It doesn't work that way. Commit your life to Christ and live a lot. Please, don't delay. All right, you say, well, Dave, I have. I long ago committed my life to Christ. But maybe you've been living out your own goals and agendas in life, seeking your own paths. It's what we do, isn't it, often? You've lived for yourself. There have been times I did too. Let me very, and I mean this very kindly. I mean this very graciously, because I've been there. But if you are living for yourself, You are wasting your life. You are wasting your life. It's as simple as that. Don't waste your life. You could be living abundantly, following the Lord instead of yourself. How many of us as Christians are really living for the Lord? Do we make our decisions about life based upon what the Lord wants? Or are we wasting our lives in trivial pursuits, things that seem important? But years from now, when the silver cord is about to break, when all of these things are happening, Will we look back on our lives and say, wow, what a waste? Or will we look back on our lives and say, wasn't perfect, Lord. I struggled many times, but I've lived for you. There's a huge difference between those two responses in old age, isn't there? A huge difference. Will you choose to follow the Lord today before you waste any more time in your life? Because when the silver cord breaks, we will all give an account before our Creator. Father, it speaks to me, certainly, because so much that I do, so much that we do, is often a waste when we think about it. 
Teach us to live each day for you. And if there's anyone here this morning who has never made that initial decision to follow the Lord, then take this moment right now and do so in the quietness of right. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to do anything to you. I just want to give you that opportunity right now to say, yes, Lord, forgive my sins. I trust you and I want to follow you. Father, I want all of us to live for you, to trust in your grace, your power, your direction for our lives. You want that, Lord, I know. Teach us to trust in you and to follow you with everything we do this week, I pray, and not to waste our lives. For the time will come, Lord, when we will face you. So help us to live for you now while we have time. In Jesus' name, amen.